All right, thanks everybody for joining. It's 12.33, we had a little audio issue. Only roughly my one million Zoom call and I'm still struggling with the audio. Um, I think we'll go ahead and get started. I'm sure people will join um, later as they finish up, as they finish up patients and can join in. But thanks for joining to our third Thursday user webinar. Uh, my name is Todd Lincoln-Beckler and I've also got Alec Filet on the call. Hello, hello. And um, we've got, um, you know, our agendas for these webinars are, are really informal. We've got a few things that we want to show you. Um, we had um, a few questions that were submitted that we want to review. And, uh, and then along the way or at the end, you know, feel free to um, ask questions, chime in, hopefully we get to thinking and maybe think of a question or two. You know, we do these live, so we don't record our webinars. So we're gonna jump in the app and show you the stuff live. And, you know, sometimes it's not perfect, but we eventually get there. So let's go ahead and get started and hopefully we can, uh, you know, we <clears throat> be done um, 35 or 45 minutes, not too terribly long. Uh, Alex, is my audio okay? I'm only hearing out of one of my head headsets right now. It is. Okay. Yeah, it, little... it sounds clear to me. Okay, cool. All right, so let me hop out of PowerPoint. I hope you guys enjoyed the music before. Back here, one of my favorites, James McMurtry. All right, so the first thing that I want to talk about is, this is gonna be a new feature that we're gonna be, let me get my, this is something that we're gonna be pushing out um, next Thursday if all of our final QA goes as planned. And this is actually a fairly significant change to EasyRx, even though I think for most on the call, if all goes according to plan, it's going to be 100% transparent to you. And that is, um, as EasyRx has expanded, we've had more and more requests to um, support different languages um, more languages than just English, like French and Spanish, Italian, etc. Because we're getting uh, more and more of an international uh, presence and more requests internationally. And we want to support that because our goal is to be the universal lab prescription platform. And so what we're going to be working on, which will come out next Thursday night, I'm on a staging server in our development methodology, staging is one step from the production server. So this is in final testing. And under account options, we are now, we're now gonna have an option to support other languages. So if you or someone you know uses EasyRx or is thinking about EasyRx, but they need EasyRx in say Spanish, we're now going to be able to support Spanish. We're still loading in all of the translations. So if you read Spanish or you can speak Spanish, uh, our translations on the screen may not be 100% accurate because we're still working on those. But the point is we're now gonna support multiple languages in the next release of EZRX. And so it's English, Spanish, French, um, Put that back to English so I can read my languages. Spanish, French, German, Italian, Japanese, Chinese, simplified, traditional, and this is a testing that will be removed when we release. And so it's really um, what's nice for us, and I think for the users that choose to enable one of these languages, it's literally an option to flip EZRX from one language to another. There's not a process to convert the application you know, if you, you know, went to the wrong language by mistake, it's, it's not an issue at all. You can easily flip it back. So it's a really cool kind of architecture and it gives us more flexibility to add additional language, 
languages long term. The way we're going to release this is everyone is going to get English by default because that's EasyRx is only in English today. And initially, if you want EasyRx in another language, you're going to have to call us to enable French on your system or Spanish or whatever. Um, so when you get, you know, you come in Friday, EasyRx is going to be in English. You won't be able to change the language. But behind the scenes, all of the support for multiple language will be in the application, and we can go in behind the scenes and change the language. What that means is, and we've been testing this for a long time, but you can, you, you know, there is a chance you could have some quirky behaviors. Um, we don't think the app's not going to run. We're pretty confident in that. But you may have some, you know, maybe it, it's a little different behavior. For example, here's one little example. Um, you may see, if I go to the dashboard right now, you'll see how submitted date and last 90 days are sitting on top of each other. So there's a little bit of a formatting issue with the table. And we're going to get this particular item fixed by next week. So you may see little things like that. Right now, if I go to the patient window, uh, it's pushed down further than normal, so it may look a little odd to you. Uh, the other thing that we've done as part of this localization change is you'll notice a lot of the tables are going to be wider. Uh, we're moving away from, we used to support a little, little uh, lower resolution monitors, but everyone's you know, got pretty high resolution monitors now. So we've made a lot of the dashboards wider. And for the most part, that'll be transparent to you, uh, except we can get a little bit more information on the screen. And, but you know, those little formatting issues, you know, we've spent a lot of time going through, you know, getting all the tables to size right. So you may see an occasional little quirkiness. Hopefully it's nothing significant. Um, and then for us, we'll have this new sort of architecture to support multiple languages. We can enable it. And, uh, you know, it's going to be great for everybody long term. If you are interested in enabling EasyRx in another language, and even interested in potentially helping us translate, because right now we've got like French in where we auto translated everything in EasyRx into French, but we know there's some refinements need to be made, especially on part names. So if you're interested in helping us translate, shoot us an email. Uh, we're certainly going to uh, look for that as we start to roll this out. So that's a little bit of what's coming. Uh, next week, hopefully it's totally transparent, um, and we'll get that out. So let's talk about a couple of other new features or a couple things I wanted to point out. Uh, number one, um, I know probably most everyone on this call does not do a lot of prescriptions for bridges. I know that's a crown of bridge feature, but we are getting more and more into restorative dentists using EZRX, maybe a pedo ortho practice using EZRX. And so we're getting into the need to support more than just kind of traditional orthodontic prescriptions. And so I want you, I want to show you a couple things that we released in the last update. So I'm going to open up a prescription in the interest of time. You may feel like this screen is a little wider than normal. I think we stretched this a hair. So one thing that we've added that everyone can benefit from, and that is on the favorites tab, if you've added any parts to your favorites tab, and for those who aren't using favorites, favorites are for those, they're not really templates. Templates are actual prescriptions that you do routinely, but maybe every time, maybe every seventh time you do a holly, you like to put a ball clasp on there. So you don't want the ball clasp on your template, but you want to be able to easily add a ball clasp. And so you could mark a ball clasp as a favorite. And to mark something as a favorite, you search the part and you click the little star to mark an, an item as a favorite. So I've got ball clasp and Adam, I, Adam's clasp as a favorite on my little demo practice. 
So what that allows you to do is I'll put a, a holly and then let's say I need a ball class. Now I can go to the favorites tab. We've had the favorites tab. Previously, you would click to add the favorited part, in this case, a ball class. And then if you didn't want it where it, was, where it landed on the prescription, you would have to move it around. It worked fine, but one something that we've added is now you can now drag from the favorites menu. So I can drag the ball class to exactly where I want it just to make it a little easier to put your favorited parts on the uh, prescription. So we support drag and drop from favorites. Favorites is not new. That's been around probably a year or so, but dragging and dropping from favorites is new. And then a new feature that we added just a couple of weeks ago, back to my comment about doing a bridge prescription, it really, wasn't easy to create a you know a prescription that required a bridge in EasyRx, and so we've added a new feature called Bridge Creator. So you'll see this new icon on the vertical icon pane on the right side, Create Bridge, and I'm going to click that, and that's going to put me in Bridge Create mode. And then you go to where you want to put the bridge. I'm going to say I want to start it here, and then this works like some of our other parts. You can just size this as needed and you're defining the teeth to include in the bridge. So I'm going to do a three unit bridge. So I mark these teeth as being, you know, part of the bridge. Under part options, you see three unit bridge and pretty nifty. This will change as you size the bridge. And so when the lab receives this prescription, the very first thing they're going to see is, oh, this is a three unit bridge. Then you put the parts or you put the components that you need to put on your bridge. And depending on your practice, you know, you may have certain preferences on crowns. I've just got a few favorited crown parts here. So I'm going to drag out my PMA provisional and put that on one of the parts on the bridge. And I could drag that out again if I wanted to. Or I could bring the dental option screen up, which this particular screen has been around for a while, but we allow you to select. I'm, a, I'm applying this particular crown to three teeth. I can do the shade. I can also just type it in. I can do stump, characteristic, margin. I can do pontic, and I can copy that to the other parts. And just like that, I did oh, put it on the wrong tooth. Move that over there. I did a nice little three unit um, bridge and defined all of the components of the bridge. And again, what's nice is when the lab receives the prescription, it's very clear that this is a three unit bridge. We also support if you need to do, you know, multiple bridges, upper and lower, that's perfectly okay. So it's not one bridge per prescription, you can have as many as you need. Now, I don't think you would ever do something like this, but certainly possible. So that's creating a bridge. That's out. And uh, you guys can start using that right now. All right. Uh, and I'm just going to keep going until you know we start getting some questions. Um, and once I go through a few more things on the new, new stuff, we want to make sure we talk about um, we're, then we're going to go through the questions that came in when people registered for the webinar. And we've got four or five questions to go over and then we can ask anything. So one of the questions that came up or comments was, you know, just love to learn maybe a tip or a trick um, that, you know, you may not talk about. And so I started, I started trying to think, you know, what's the kind of a cool tip and trick and, and then I had a conversation with a lab yesterday and the lab commented about they really like receiving feedback from their practices on their prescriptions. And so this was, you know, a lab that obviously like all labs, very into quality control and they really wanted to get feedback. 
which got me thinking, you know, I don't know how many practices are actually using our prescription feedback feature. So I wanted to go over that. Some of you may know about this, but it's a webinar, so let's talk about it. So one of the cool things about EZRX, when you are reviewing a prescription, over on the left side, when you're viewing a prescription, there is a link to provide prescription feedback. And it's a really simple form. We polled a few doctors, you know, it's hard to have everyone's preferred items. So we polled some doctors and we came up with, let's ask feedback on four specific items, doctor time, fit, finish, accuracy, and timeliness. And it's kind of the traditional five-star, you know, rating system. So you can provide feedback. Um, overall fine work on this or that, right? What's nice is the lab that you submit prescription feedback to, they can go in and review prescription feedback globally and for each practice. So they see your prescription feedback, not only when they're viewing the prescription, but when they can get, there's a screen where they can go in and look at it and export it and all that. So to make it easy for you, if you wanna make sure you're providing prescription feedback, on the dashboard, there's a menu option awaiting feedback. And so this is just a list of cases that um, have come in that you should, if you want to, provide prescription feedback on. It's really pretty simple. So here are some cases. We show the patient, office doctor, which lab it went to, and then um, you can click view, obviously go in, provide prescription feedback, and you know, make sure that you've now submitted feedback and that name has now been removed from the list. You can also get to this screen if you go to stats, not stats, scripts. And if I go to feedback, back to my original comment, see how this menu option's a little bit centered. We're working on this one, but here's a little sizing issue we're still fixing as we get ready to release localization. If you go to scripts and you go to feedback, this is where you can see actual feedback that you've provided. So you can pick a date range, you can pick a particular doctor at the practice, you can pick a particular lab and get all of the feedback that you've submitted to that lab. So here's for all my doctors for the W Ortho lab, here are, here's all of the cases that I've provided feedback. You can see your average, and then there's a handy little export button right here. So you can easily export this out if you wanna review it, if you wanna email it over to them and they, they can get to the same information. So, you know, I don't think it's a very heavily used feature. I think it's a really powerful feature. It's kind of like, lab prescription, you know, we should be doing this, right? We have all the information, we have the interface, so we should make it easy for you to submit feedback and then, you know, make it easy for your lab to be able to receive the feedback so they can make better prescriptions for you. All right, uh, trucking right along here. I'm gonna log out of the staging server and I want to log into the live site and I want to talk about uh, our help center. And hey, when you get customers on the phone, you should always talk about how to make sure that they know how to get help. And so I'm logged in on the live site and I'm going to go up to contact support. And I'm sure you know our phone number and our email and you probably maybe have chatted with us. I just want to make sure you're aware of a couple of things. Number one, we do have the EZRX YouTube channel which we're pretty often updating and you should um, you know subscribe to our channel 
So when we put a new video up, you get a little reminder like you do for your other YouTube channels that you've subscribed to. And so you should, you know, subscribe to the EasyRx YouTube channel. Uh, number two, I'm going to go to the Help Center and point out a couple things in the Help Center. And so in addition to our Facebook user group, which I know a lot of you are on and we get a fair amount of chatter on that, which is wonderful. We also have the Help Center where we also post messages about what is going on with EasyRx. So you can kind of see any messages. So, you know, we posted an update, new changes and parts posted to EasyRx two days ago. And then you can open that guy up and then you can hop right over to the um, knowledge base article and review about all the changes. The other thing I want to point out is we have a respectable number of articles in our help center knowledge base. And so, you know, and this is one of those, like probably every company, we're always trying to add more knowledge bases, but this is a good resource to come. And for sure, you can read about all of our updates, which will be educational, uh, especially if you're newer at EZRX, you can go back and read about everything we've added 2018, 2019, and now 2020. At one point we did a KV for every month that we released an update and then we changed where we just do yearly. I think it's easier for everyone to read. So you can come here. And the other thing I want to point out is my area. And I don't think anyone uses this, which is really our fault for not communicating this out. But I'm going to go to my area and one thing you can do from here, why that looks pretty cool, is you can add a support ticket. Now, obviously, you can always jump in and do a chat with us. And when you do a chat with us, and let's say we missed the chat, it's after hours, we're all on the phone or chatting with somebody else, that automatically creates a support ticket. So that goes right into our ticketing system. Well, you can also do the same thing. So maybe it's, uh, it's in the evening and you have a quick question or you don't want to do a chat because you only got a couple minutes, you can come and you can add a ticket and you pick the EZRX support ticket template. This is going to EZRX support. And you can add a question, how do I do this or that? Type out a little bit more, pick the priority. They're all going to go to the same spot. Um, you've got to pick a classification. Maybe it's a question or a problem or enhancement request. Maybe it's about 3D integration related, a billing question, a sales question, color chart, part and appliance request or template. This, I'm going to mark this as question. You can even upload files. So you can upload a drawing of the part that you've requested. If you've sketched out an enhancement request, which some customers do, you can upload your enhancement request, and then you can submit that ticket, and that creates a ticket in our ticketing system. It goes in as unassigned, and we re review unassigned kind of all day, every day, right? And what's nice is you can now see all of your open tickets and any closed tickets and how they were resolved. And I'm going to open up this ticket because I created this one before the webinar. We can add comments to the ticket, as you would expect, and tell you what the status is. We can reply and include links to knowledge base articles in here. Um, so this, to, this is just another way to communicate with our support team. I mean, we're always going to be there for a phone call. Right, we love talking to you. We've got chat, but if you just want to do kind of the ticket thing, send us a ticket, we'll review it and um, reply back. And then if we need to, we can do a screen share and whatever, whatever. So I don't think many people use that. It uses it. What's nice is it uses your EasyRx login. So the same username and password that you use to log into EasyRx will log you into the EasyRx Help Center. So if you are not logged into EZRX and you come to the EZRX Help Center over here, there'll be an option to log in. I'm logged in as my little demo lab. 
and you can log in and it would be your EasyRx username and password. Whenever you change your EasyRx password, it's gonna change it for the Help Center also. So it's, it's very easy to do. Okay, uh, that's that. Now let's go through a few of the questions. Um, let's, let me log out from, I wanna go back on staging so I can play around with live or with data. So one is a question we had was, um, and this may, we may have to have whoever asked this or the two people maybe chime in. One question was how to have faster uploads and faster downloads. And I'm not exactly sure exactly what that means. So maybe if you're on the call, you could chime in. A couple things that we always tell people, especially in another one, self saving models, we are, if we get a comment from a customer that say, hey, it's taking a long time to open a, a file, and usually faster upload and faster download is there, you know, that refers to SDL files and probably around 3D, EZRX 3D and basic models. So anytime it takes a long time to open an EZRX file or a SDL file in EZRX 3D or save a file in <clears throat> EZRX 3D, the first thing we generally check is, is there any virus scanning that is running? So is there real-time virus scanning? So every time an STL file is opened, it's gotta be scanned and you know, they're 15 megabytes, so it takes a while to scan them. Um, because generally, for the most part, people have pretty fast internet today, so it's not usually just internet speed, even though occasionally it can be that. Um, so that's usually the first thing we, we, we check. Um, so maybe if they're on the call, we could chime in with a specific question there. Um, the second question was, um, another question was Mark, making custom templates. And I'm gonna point you to where we do custom templates and then um, not to get into too detailed of how to do it. Uh, we can call support or you know, we can schedule a, a quick little screen share, but I'm gonna to go to the templates menu and I've got a bunch of templates, but to create a custom template, you click on new template and this up, this comes opens up the create prescription template window, and you would just go through and drag out the parts or the appliances to create the templates. You can set some defaults like the default model source if you got some bands on the template. Templates can be assigned to. Let me get back out. Templates can be used for multiple labs or a specific lab. So maybe you create a template you, you only wanna use when you're creating a prescription for your in-house lab, or maybe only when you wanna create it for Ferro lab. So templates can be assigned. And we do have, under the EZRX help topic window on the right side, I don't know if this is gonna come up on staging, but if you click this on the live site, We've got a, a really detailed video on how to create templates that you could you could watch. Also, that's not just that screens, it's not set up on staging. One point I'll make uh, for that person who asked that question, when you select a lab, the templates displayed are the templates that have been assigned to that lab. And that's what's really powerful, the templates is for day-to-day -day use, the staff, they pick the lab and the templates that they can use for that lab are displayed. And it'll change as you pick different labs. So it's important once you've created your templates to go through and review, review your assignments and make sure that they're assigned to the right lab. So I got all different templates now. Okay, another question that came in was, um, 
kind of managing the dashboard, a couple questions around that. One, how do you mark cases as received and delivered in bulk? And how do you kind of clean up the dashboard? So let me ask the answer the first question first, which is mark cases as received, delivered in bulk. And so on the dashboard, you know, the mark cases as received or delivered, option one, you can go through individually. Option two is you go over to the, the dashboard table, mark cases as received and delivered. And the option here is you go through and you click, click, click to select the cases. Maybe I want to mark all of those as received and they were received at my Woodstock office. So I've now marked those cases as received. And then same thing would apply for delivered. I can go through and do click, click, and I can mark cases as delivered to the patient. So both of these are sort of, I don't want to say end of day, but received would be when you get your packages in from your lab, you open them up and you can come here and click, 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 and then mark them as received. Delivered is probably marking cases as delivered and kind of bulk format is probably something done towards the end of the day. So, because you know what patients have come in that day, right? So you know which patients have had their appliances delivered or first thing in the morning. So you come here and you do, you know, click, click, click and mark cases as, as delivered. And obviously it's very, very simple. You do that. And that's going to update the, uh, the dashboard. So the second half of that question is, um, how do you just purge the dashboard? I think was the phrasing on the, the, the questionnaire, you know, how do you manage your dashboard? And so to start with, um, cases are never removed from the dashboard uh, because we have to preserve the case history, right? For HIPAA and ADA, right? We got to preserve all these prescriptions. So prescriptions are never, quote, removed from the dashboard. What you need to do is move them to a status where day to day you don't see them on the dashboard by default. For example, um, we see a lot of practices who don't mark cases as received back from the lab or delivered to the patient. And so if they're never marking cases that say delivered to the patient and they go and they pick all, then their um, submitted date of all delivered is no, then they're gonna see hundreds of and hundreds of cases potentially because they did not mark their cases as delivered to the patient. And so one thing kind of where we start when we get the question of, I got a lot of cases on my dashboard where we sort of start is, okay, well, let's mark some cases as delivered. And a lot of times it's like, well, you know, we have more cases as delivered in a year. Well, let's mark everything eight months and older as delivered. And we'll just assume they got delivered to the patient. Now you could always go back to mark cases as delivered, right? You could sort by, you could see all cases marked as delivered, no, and uh, maybe change date needed. So your oldest cases appear first and start going through this list. Maybe pick all of these that were way back in 2017, change your dashboard to show 100 cases at a time and mark those as delivered. All right. <clears throat> but the back to the, you know, the, the big picture point is the dashboard will always show all cases. It's designed to filter out cases based on their statuses. So you can always get back to them, but day to day you're not seeing them. And the two most common areas are 
marking cases as received back from the lab are two most common areas where we don't see cases, where we don't see cases marked properly. We don't see a mark as received and we don't see a marked as delivered. And that kind of clutters up when you go look at, you know, all cases or something and you see 562 and you're like, oh my gosh, you have 562 cases out there. Well, you know, 528 of them have already been delivered to the patient because you're not marking those cases as delivered. So that would be the, uh, my thought. Alex, do you have um, anything I've missed there? I know you deal with that a little bit more than I do. No, yeah, that's, yeah, exactly. Just, you know, favorites can also be useful because you can set up these different views in that drop down so that people playing a different role in your group might want to see one view and then they could you know set that um, and, and filter that way but, but yeah I, I um, think you covered it yeah okay uh, Alex I'm not I'll let you Dave W out of chat if you want to yeah is there a place for completed for in-house labs um, so what I typically do when I show people the in-house lab is I will make a favorite view or yet to be completed, meaning I set the status filter to show cases that have been submitted to the in-house lab and that are checked in, so cases that are actively being worked on, but I will have it filter out everything that has been marked as completed. And then just to round things off, I'll make a second favorite view to just show cases that are completed in case you want to go back and look at old work. Um, you know, there are different ways of going back and looking at your, your history. You can go into the patient profile, you can go up to scripts, but um, it, from what I've heard, a lot of in-house lab techs would like to be able to flip from their yet to be completed favorite view right to the, uh, to the completed favorite view. Good idea. And, and uh, if the question was, you know, when you're viewing a case on the in-house lab, there is an option to mark it case completed here. We don't have a bulk way to mark in-house lab cases as completed, if that's what you were asking. Um, right, right. But you can mark, um, you have to mark them individually. Yeah. Yeah. So you get to know your in-house lab cases a little bit better, I guess. You know, we don't have, that's a great idea. We should do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to finish up by doing some work in 3D because we have four or five questions in 3D. Uh, if there are not any more questions on purging or dashboard or what have you. All right, so I'm going to log out and I'm going to log into the live site, hop back in my demo account on the lab site. So a couple questions we had. Number one, someone asked to see bracket removal. A couple uh, customers asked about block out, angle base, and um, model trimming with, with brag removal. So let me let me do a quick little overview of brag removal and show you the block out tool. So let me jump into a, let me see here. Oh, that's right. I put my, okay. So let's go get um, this little guy right here. And let's walk you through bragger removal. We've got about, I'm a little long. We've got, I'll try to do this in about 10 minutes or so. But we've had bracket removal out now for a little over, well, probably more like 15 months now. I think it was AAO of um, 19 when we kind of went all in on bragger removal. Um, for the practices that their workflow uh, they can scan with brackets on. Uh, it's very popular. Obviously, not every practice likes to scan with brackets on. But for the practices that like that workflow, I think this has been a really nice addition to let them, you know, do same day retainers, for example. Uh, anytime you're going to do bracket removal or do anything in 3D, you have to orient the model. So let me go orient the model. So here's a um, uh, scan with some brackets and let's remove a few brackets so you can see how it works. So I'm going to go over to the left side. No sounds. You, I'm sorry. I think that was someone else. Um, if you have bracket removal um, enabled, you see this menu option on the left. I'm going to pick bracket removal. 
And just like easy model trim, if you've used EasyRx3D, I'm holding down the shift key, left mouse button, and I'm dragging the mouse around the bracket. And you'll notice I'm away from the bracket and bracket pad or any glue. So you don't want to be touching that bracket pad. And then you click remove bracket and that bracket has been removed. And then you go on to the next one. Same idea. Now we wish all brackets were it not near the gingiva like these two brackets. So this one is nice and clean. I mean, so I didn't quite make a good selection there. I'm trying to work fast in the interest of time. So my circle isn't quite complete. So that's what that red message was. You just got to complete the circle and then it'll remove the bracket. Let me go back and let me do one that's kind of up in the gingiva so you can see how that looks. So I'm drawing around the bracket. Yeah, just going to chime in. It's preferable to go really wide around even the pad or the what might be the glue. And like Todd is doing here, you're going to want to go well below all of that area that you're trying to remove because it's preferable to have to go back and refine it because if you catch just a little bit of the bracket, it's going to leave um, yeah. a good bit of surface you're going to have to fight through. So in fact, this is fairly close to the bracket and this is, just so you can see, I'm going to click remove bracket. Let's see what we get here. And that did okay. There's a little bit of a, a, a you know, knob here and here. And so we've got some refinement tools as part of bracket removal, build, carve, smooth margin, block out and cut out. And I don't need that over here, move that back. So let's get rid of this little guy. So one thing I could do if I wanted to remove material, and not a great example, but I can do something like that, and you wouldn't do that because that wasn't that big of a spot. But you can remove material, and then you can click on smooth. And I've got the shift key held down, left mouse button, and I'm kind of drawing around the edge to smooth that out. And then I'm going to click margin, and I'm going to draw in the margin. And this is not scientific, right? This is best guess based on your knowledge and experience. I'm going to do something like that, right? You just want that retainer to fit properly. And then I'm going to go back and smooth that out and do something like that. If I don't like my smooth, I'm going to do it again. And then over on the refine to surface panel, as you pick different refinement tools, you'll see there are some options to change the size and depth. For example, I have carve. And just so you can kind of see, uh, this is going to be huge, but this, I want you to see it, you know, you can do something like that by adjusting size and depth. So we have some flexibility. What happens as you pick different options, we pick the default setting. So we kind of gave it a, this is what we think is a good starting point, and that's the default, but you can change it each time. So that is, and build is the opposite. Let me remove another bracket here. And back to how you don't want to catch the corner of the bracket, say that you make it all the way around and then you accidentally get the corner, you can use erase selection. Right here. You just wipe out that one little area instead of having to start all over from scratch. I can do that, finish erasing, and do that, and then go in and remove bracket. And then maybe I wanted to build something up just so you can see the tool. I'm going to click build, and build adds to surface. So I could do, you know, again, just so you can see, you know, do something like that. Which leads to the request for block out. Now, <clears throat> this particular scan, 
<clears throat> it's not a great um, real life example <clears throat> because you probably wouldn't have the space. <clears throat> but just so you can see the block out tool, I'm going to click block out and it does something like this. So you can block out some material to allow that retainer to fit a little better. And again, you can make that as big as uh, you need to. We also have cutout. And again, maybe not the best model to demonstrate this on, but you get the idea. You want a little cutout right here. You can do that. And maybe you want to make that a hair bigger. You can do that. So that is uh, bracket removal. The um, it's really fairly simple. You do a few remove a few brackets, and you kind of get the process. Um, obviously, the um, it's manual, right? So you have to do it on each um, each bracket on each tooth. Uh, you know, we're hearing you know five to seven minutes an arch if it's uh, a full you know, brackets on <clears throat> full set of brackets on upper uh, would be five to seven minutes and lower five to seven minutes. If it's a little, you know, three to three, you know, maybe half that. Todd, what's our stance on the um, wires? Like if it's possible to have the wires removed, we want to make that happen, right? Because it's just going to end up, I mean, yeah. I, I've used artifact removal to take wires out, but it's going to, in a lot of cases make you have to really lean on the refinement tools to yeah to yeah so the um the challenge with bracket removal um is when you look at the data there's no clear differentiator between where does the bracket end and where does the two surface begin so all of this is kind of extrapolation on where it should where the bracket should be removed but leave the two surface. And that's the challenge. When you add the wire in there, it gets even more complicated. And as Alec points out, it's very tedious to remove the wire uh, just because it's really hard to differentiate that because there's a wire, then there's some open air between that and the tooth. So it's just complicated. So our official recommendation is to scan without the wire to remove brackets. You can, if you want to spend some time, remove a wire. Uh, I don't think you would want to make it your regular protocol, but if you need to, you can either use bracket removal or artifact removal to remove the uh, wire. Uh, but you're going to find that that five to seven minutes is now 12 to 15 probably, right? And maybe it'd been faster to take the wire out. I saw a few, um, and that's also true of attachments. You can use bracket removal to remove attachments. Um, you know, a little bit easier to remove attachments and to remove wires. But if you do have attachments on a scan, you can use bracket removal tool to remove the uh, attachment. Yeah, we, we had a chat asking if we could make uh, some refinement tools available outside of the bracket removal package, um, particularly undercuts. Yeah, yeah. So we have, um, we bundled it in. It's kind of all connected. So it's easy, it's not easy for us to not, it's all kind of part of the same part of the software. So we have some, if you're just interested in the refinement tools, if you want to shoot us an email, I have a, you know, Thomas or Marcus follow up, then we can, you know, work something out. Just so you, the cost of rag removal, for those that don't have it, it's $495 to enable it on your, your uh, EZRX 3D uh, feature or product. And then that includes the software and then unlimited number of rag removals for three months. And then after three months, it's $2.45 for every patient that you remove brackets on, not scans, break, patient. So if you do an upper and a lower on a patient, it's $2.45. And um, so it's very reasonably priced. 
Um, so it's $4.95, three months unlimited, and then $2.45 after three months. There's another question. We have ULab, so we were told not to purchase BRAC removal with EZRX. Um, so I know that there's a bit of an overlap with what ULab does, but would you say that that is a yeah, fair thing you, to say? Did you hear that from us? I guess would be my first question. Right. I don't think we would, I don't think we would recommend that. Um, you know, EZRX and ULab, you know, we have a very nice integration, great working relationship. You know, their, their workflow obviously required that they have rack removal for scans that come in, you know, obviously not from EZRX. We have it. Um, I think my suggestion, it's perfectly okay to have both. Um, what I've been told is, depending on which plan you have from ULab, uh, I think their pricing is based on the number of scans that you um, export out of ULab. And versus EZRX is just a two dollar and forty five cent per patient charge, so something to look at. But there's no reason you can't have both, uh, depending on how you need to use either in your workflow. Oh, somebody asked about angling the base. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I knew there was something else. I'm just reading the list. All right, so uh, angling base. So a new feature, a couple new features in 3D we added is an option angled base. So we added easy base uh, and angle base. To talk about angle base, let me go draw a little trim path on this guy. And this isn't a great model to do angle base on because Pretty, uh, pretty small model, but we can, you guys can get the idea. So if you're gonna use angled base, you use easy model trim to draw your trim path. I'm gonna pull that up in here just so we can, uh, so I'm trimming. And then I'm gonna go click angle base. And that puts a horizontal cutting plane. Try to get this so visually you can see it. And you can control, this is the cutting plane. It's added to the base parallel to the occlusal plane, but you can then adjust that. I'm gonna slide that up. And then you can adjust that up. I'm going to move this way up just so when I base it, it'll be obvious. But I'm, and this isn't a great model to show this, but you're able to angle the base. So when the model is trimmed, it's also going to trim it at this angle. When you choose angled base, you'll notice the base height options are grayed out because this program is going to determine the base height automatically based on the angle and positioning of your angled base cutting plane. Um, so the base height is grayed out because you can't choose that. And I'm gonna do regular base, then I'm gonna click add base. And this, I'm not on this like 15 or 20 seconds maybe, but in one step it's gonna trim and then add the base. So the workflow on angled base is, and you can see, you know, I do all my demos on like the demo server. This first time in a live, this thing's fast. So you can see how it, and I didn't have a great angle because this base wasn't great. You can see how it's now angled the base. And we get this question a good bit. What do the yellow uh, boxes mean? And what we're trying to tell you is that part of the model is thin. You may not see it visually when you're looking at the model, but this part of the model is thin and we don't recommend if you put your label on the bottom of the model and you engrave, don't put your label on the yellow cause it's too thin right there to support a engraved label. So that's what the yellow boxes mean. But there is a angle base.
What else do we have? I Alex? think we covered everything. I'm just double checking. Good. Um, you know, back to the faster upload, faster download. If, if you want to contact us about that, we can hop on that computer. As well as those, you know, custom templates. We'll take a look at those requests. Yep. Um, but I think that's it. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Sorry, I went over a little bit. There's lots of good stuff on this, this webinar. So thanks for joining. Thanks for being a supportive EZRX customer. We really appreciate it. And everybody well, have, a, have a good rest of the day. One last question yeah. came in at the buzzer. Can we engrave on the bottom now? Um, Todd, wouldn't you recommend against that because the printer would kind of fill it in and needs a complete layer? I know that um, some aligner groups will issue their models with the label on the bottom. So. Yeah. Uh, as far as EZRX 3D goes, it supports engraving on the bottom. Now, the um, your good point. The printer, each printer is going to have a little different opinion on if you're actually going to be able to see the label after you print the model, depending on how uh, the model has to be, you know, seated into the build plate. But EZRX certainly supports engraving models on the bottom, even though I haven't done that in a long, long time. Yeah, if, if it gives you trouble, um, you know, just connect with us and we can try to diagnose yeah. if it's uh, something that the printer's having trouble with or why it's... Uh, if you're having trouble, yeah, if you're having trouble engraving in EZRX, we can get that fixed. That should be working. It's not working for me, so maybe we need to look into that, but that should be working. Yeah, he said goodbye. And we will be um, emailing these out. Todd, how it takes us a day or so, right? Yeah, well, a day or so, and we'll put it up on our YouTube page, and, and um, I think we post it on Facebook user group on the Help Center and EZRX. Yeah, we do have a Facebook kind of forum user group um, that you all can join if, if you have not already. So thanks for the great webinar. You are certainly welcome and um, connect with us about that one issue. We'll do it again on the third Thursday of September. All right, y'all take care. Thanks everybody. Have a good one.